is I want to share with you for about 18 minutes or less what the Holy Spirit has given to me. We're not going back. We're not going back. Although we've been distracted by a plethora of social justice issues and an impending historic election that will undoubtedly change the future of America forever, the long anticipated relaunch of the NBA and any number of other social, political, or cultural events, the cold hard truth remains that this coronavirus is here for the long haul. So here's what scientists predict for the next months and years up through June 2021. By that time, the world will have been in the pandemic mode for a year and a half, and the virus will continue to spread at a slow burn, and intermittent lockdowns will be the new normal. An approved vaccine will offer at best six months of protection, but international deal making will slow its distribution. An estimated 250 million people will have become infected worldwide, and another 1.75 million will have died. Forecasts such as this one imagine how the COVID-19 pandemic might play out. Around the world, epidemiologists are constructing short and long-term projections as a way to prepare for and potentially mitigate the spread and impact of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And although their predictions and timelines may vary, scientists do agree on two things. COVID-19 is here to stay. And what will be our new normal depends on a lot of unknowns, including whether people can develop lasting immunity to the virus, whether seasonality affects its spread, and perhaps most importantly, the choices made by governments and individuals. The future will very much depend on how much social mixing resumes, and what kind of preventions and protections are in place. And so I'm sharing this not to scare you or make you feel uncomfortable. The media is already doing a great job of that, but simply to offer a clear cut interpretation of our current reality. And what reality is that preacher? I'm glad you asked. We're not going back. I can't help, brothers and sisters, but reflect upon the story of the Hebrew children when Brother Moses led them up out of their bondage in Pharaoh's Egypt. And after they were compelled by a mighty hand, they came out. They crossed over the Jordan and entered into an uncertain future in the wilderness of Paran. Numbers 14, chapters 1 through 4 says, Then all of the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and go back. To Egypt. Surely the people of God wanted their freedom, yet they found themselves woefully unprepared for the great responsibilities and demands which freedom required of them. They had become conditioned or gotten so used to the comforts and familiarities of their old lives back in Egypt that they were afraid of the new challenges and difficulties involved in building a better life as an independent and self-sufficient people. I'm reminded of a proverb I learned from my parents and grandparents, which said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. For those unversed in traditional African-American proverbial wisdom, it simply means that once you eat the cake, you no longer have cake anymore. In other words, you can't go back to having the cake that you've already eaten. You can't have it both ways. Once the cake is gone, it is finished. And so now you must do something different. Now you must move on. Now you must learn how to bake or work to earn some money to buy another cake. If freedom, I mean, if cake is what you truly want. Somebody text a friend or neighbor and tell them, there's a time to stand still and there's a time to move on. We had a saying back in the 70s in our church that said, freedom ain't free. 
How many of you know the offers, life offer us for living provides no free lunch? The African nation Israel failed to comprehend that leaving Egypt was not the end of their struggle, but only the beginning. Now that they were shaken loose from the oppression of their Egyptian cousins, they had to learn how to struggle and build and create a nation for themselves. And nobody promised them that it would be easy. Somebody tell those folks out protesting about defunding the police that in the interim, they better be trying to figure out how to effectively police their own neighborhoods and communities. Because freedom ain't free. The painful reality the Hebrew children didn't want to face was that going back to life before COVID-19, I mean, going back to life before they left Egypt was not an option. The Holy Spirit gave me a message that says, open your beautiful brown eyes and read the handwriting on the wall. Like it or not, we are moving into a new normal and no matter what comes, we're not going back. We can do like the Hebrew children and give our leaders the blues about how much we miss the former things and how much we want to go back to the old landmark. But the reality is we are not going back. We are not going back to life before masks, physical distancing, and the regular use of hand sanitizer. We're not going back to all child and adult education taking place in school buildings, college campuses, or universities. They're already shutting down colleges that have only been open for two weeks. We're not going back to the capacity-filled sports arenas and music theaters and concert halls and play theaters. We're not going back anytime soon to having church in a building. We're not going back to big gatherings like weddings and funerals and fellowships and banquets and baptisms and summer camps and retreats being held indoors. We're not going back to in-person graduations and retirement parties and receptions and showers and family reunions and hotels, parks, or rental halls. We're not going back to overcrowded airports and cruise ships and unrestricted border crossings and the freedom to travel or vacation anytime, any place, anywhere we choose. Moses had to tell the people of God in Old Testament times the very same thing I'm trying to tell somebody today. We're not going back to Egypt, where we had pans of meat to eat and bread to our heart's content. So if we are not going back, preacher, tell us, please, what then must we do? We must begin by letting go of our many preconceived notions and cultural preferences and fixed mindsets, acting as if there's only one way to bake a cake or teach a class, or learn a new skill, or worship the Lord our God who is revealed to all and known by many names. What are you saying, preacher? We've got to use our limitless ingenuity and creativity to think of new ways of moving from this new norm. We must find new ways to build and sustain our group life, new ways to exercise our minds, bodies, and spirits, new ways to build and expand our sacred circle to establish a stronger black community fabric, new ways to practice social ministry and to help improve the lives of our brothers and sisters. We've got to come up with some new ways to raise the consciousness of our people, new ways to practice self-determination and cooperative economics and to perform the daily task that will lead us one step closer to a pan-African world community with power. And if we're not going back, and all the signs of the times are showing us this, then we ought to be using our resources to practice good stewardship and to chart new paths for a new generation of nation builders. We need new paths new paths for our personal and collective growth to ensure that we are not left behind by the inescapable turbulence of global transformation taking place right before our very eyes. Saints, we are living through an unprecedented shift in human consciousness. And anytime you find yourself at a crossroads such as this, you have a very important decision to make. What decision is that, preacher? Are we going to stand still 
and remain in a state of flux while life passes us by? Or are we going to put one foot in front of the other and say, Lord, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know where this new road is going to lead, but I do know I'm going to trust you to lead us safely through. So all the way through this pandemic, brothers and sisters, we've got to do like Brother Moses and follow where Yahweh leads us. We got to do like Brother Marcus and answer the call to our divine passage into a new future. We got to do like Congressman John Lewis and stay the course by making our lives a selfless example of servanthood for the uplifting of our people. We got to do like prophet Isaiah when he heard that still small voice of God saying unto him, who shall go for us? Whom shall I send? And he responded saying, here I am, Lord, send me. We got to do like our standard bearer, the black Messiah Jesus, when he told his disciples and followers not to worry about the things they could not control, because if the Most High watches over a little bitty sparrow, then surely he watches over you and me. We got to do like the most determined of all God's tiniest creatures, that ever busy worker ant that never allows any obstacle, whether rain, wind, storm, or sun, to stop it from taking care of its business and reaching its goals. We've got to do like our beloved founder and those folks who walked out of St. Mark's Church, not knowing what the future would hold or where they were going to worship God next or how they were going to organize and build on behalf of their brothers and sisters, but they trusted God and they stepped out on faith saying, it's time to move on. I'm reminded of an old song, Sister Dara, that the Nation Airs used to sing way back in the early 70s. The song said, we're standing too long in one place. That's why we've got to move on. We've got to fight on for our race. That's why we've got to move on. God is with us in the first place. That's why we've got to move on. And there is just no time to waste. That's why we've got to move on. Glory, hallelujah. That's why we've got to move on. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I today and is telling us we cannot stay where we are. It's time. We've got to move on. Ashe and amen.